It's been a really volatile few months for Bitcoin. Just look at a chart of Bitcoin's price in the last 12 months. In January 2021, Bitcoin surpassed $40,000 a coin, but some of the biggest names in finance say that it could be several times that by the end of the year. It's probably going to 100, then 150, then 200,000. And unlike Bitcoin's rally in 2017, which saw the price rise exponentially and then plummet, crypto experts say that this time, Bitcoin's run higher will last. I don't think it's a bubble. Well, this rally is a is a game changer. This is the one we've all been waiting for. The COVID pandemic and the subsequent central bank actions is what really drove most of the institutions into this space. I, I can't tell you how many folks I've spoken with who have said, I never really looked at this seriously until March of, of 2020. Didi Tahutu, his wife and three kids, bet all they have on Bitcoin. I never had second thoughts. I'm always like, yeah, it goes up and it goes down. So <laughs> it will come uh, good again. It will go back up. I'm always uh, a positive believer. Even pro athletes are going all in on Bitcoin. NFL player Russell Okung is the first player in the professional football league to essentially collect a portion of his $13 million salary in cryptocurrency. Which seemed like a good idea, as Bitcoin topped $40,000 a coin at the start of 2021, but it's since fallen from that record high. So what's going on with Bitcoin? The price of Bitcoin hit a record high in January 2021, topping $40,000. And some analysts say the cryptocurrency has a lot of room to run higher. Analysts at JP Morgan think Bitcoin prices could rally as high as $146,000, and the global head of City FX Technicals says the charts signal that Bitcoin could reach 318,000 by December 2021. Taihutu bought the bulk sum of his Bitcoin holdings when it was trading at around $900 in early 2017. At Bitcoin's peak in January 2021, his investment was up roughly 4,400%. But the family didn't cash out. Instead, they just spend more when Bitcoin is up and they spend less when it goes down. We live on the flow of Bitcoin. So we don't really worry about the, about the capital, the value we have. You know, We know that we have enough to live every month. Even as Bitcoin peaked during its 2017 rally, the family stayed invested in the volatile cryptocurrency. Once the bubble burst and the price tumbled down to around $3,000, Tahutu and his family doubled down on their Bitcoin gamble. I never doubted that, that, uh, that we would crash to zero. We, we bought more. You know, it's, it's the cycle. It's a market cycle. And every stock and every asset in the world has a market cycle. Or Bitcoin has a market cycle as well. Part of what's different about Bitcoin's rally in 2020 versus 2017 is that institutional investors are now adopting Bitcoin, lending it newfound legitimacy and helping to erase the reputational risk of investing in the cryptocurrency. 2017 was an exciting time, but uh, really was, I guess you could summarize it as a crypto native and retail driven market. Uh, it, it definitely brought some eyeballs and headlines to the space, which I think was beneficial in the long run. But most of what that market represented was a much, much less mature market than we see today. We've seen the majority of folks like uh, insurance firms and asset managers, hedge funds, uh, corporate uh, balance sheets come into the market in 2020. Data from Glassnode shows that about 95% of Bitcoin's market capitalization is kept in wallets that hold at least one Bitcoin, indicating that the vast majority of Bitcoin holders today are mostly wealthier investors rather than the smaller scale retail speculators. Well-established billionaire hedge fund managers Stanley Druckenmiller and Paul Tudor Jones now own Bitcoin and big fintech players like Square and PayPal are also adding crypto products. This kind of mainstream adoption is hugely important because cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin aren't backed by an asset, nor do they have the full faith and backing of a central government. They're valuable because people believe that they're valuable. So it goes a long way when some of the biggest names on Wall Street buy in. Bitcoin can be used to buy, sell, and price goods. And big fintech players like PayPal now allow users to buy things with Bitcoin. So is it a currency? That is the original intent of Bitcoin. It was to replace um, our fiat paper uh, currency and it's supposed to be digital. But Bitcoin also behaves a lot like a commodity, such as gold or oil. Its price is highly volatile, and there's a marketplace where it can be bought and sold. I view Bitcoin as a commodity. It is 
driven by supply and demand. It trades like a commodity, it trades like a financial asset. And similar to other commodities, you can speculate on the future price of Bitcoin through the derivatives market. Plus, in 2015, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission officially classed Bitcoin as a commodity in the US. So Bitcoin fits a couple different definitions. For me, it's a combination. For me, it's a store of value. I'm protecting my wealth, you know, because I have full control of my Bitcoins. Whatever might happen to, uh, you know, to governments or banking system, you know, I am I am com full control of all my wealth and a part of that is store of value and a part of that I use a peer-to-peer -peer cash as a currency. But even though Bitcoin can be used to buy and sell goods, the numbers show that more investors are choosing to store their Bitcoin rather than spend it, which isn't all that surprising given Bitcoin's sky-high price projections. The number of accounts buying more than a million dollars worth of Bitcoin and then moving it off the exchanges is up 180% from 2017 to 2020, according to Chainalysis, a blockchain forensics firm, which goes to show that in the midst of economic and geopolitical turmoil, more and more investors are turning to Bitcoin to weather the storm. JP Morgan now says that if Bitcoin's market cap keeps growing, it could actually rival gold as a safe haven asset. A big part of what makes a digital cryptocurrency like Bitcoin so safe is the technology that was used to build it. It's something called blockchain, and you can think of it as the digital ledger where all Bitcoin transactions are stored. All of those Bitcoin transactions aren't getting authorized by a central bank. Instead, they're being computed by a network of people around the world. In the 12 years of history, not a single entry on its blockchain has been fraudulent. Now, they processed probably close to 10 trillion dollars of transactions and not a single false entry in the mean you know that same 12 year period of time what percent of banking system activity was false it's probably close to seven or eight percent the decentralized nature of cryptocurrencies like bitcoin is a big part of what gives it its value to achieve that kind of security while being completely permissionless anyone can actually transact on this i mean that's a pretty incredible feat and so I think that's why Bitcoin is valuable, because the more people that own and use it and then begin to transact on it, the more valuable uh, the Bitcoin is itself. Analysts say that the Bitcoin rally, which began at the end of 2020, also has a lot to do with the fact that there is a finite supply of Bitcoin in the world. There will only ever be 21 million Bitcoins in existence, because like other cryptocurrencies, it was built around the principle of a finite supply. As of January 2021, the total number of mined Bitcoins is at roughly 18.6 million, so it's nearing its maximum threshold. The surge in interest from mainstream financial players it hasn't just reformed Bitcoin's image, it's also fomented a supply shortage. It comes down to supply and demand. There's, there's a lot of demand, there's not enough supply of Bitcoin for every financial institution to have their own reserve to serve their clients or to serve their customers. Just take PayPal. It began allowing its 360 plus million users to buy, sell, and hold Bitcoin in October 2020. The company will need to buy Bitcoin somewhere. And then there's Visa, which is working with 25 digital currency companies on a mix of Bitcoin-related products and services. Experts agree that what we are looking at is a potentially huge supply crisis, because there won't be enough new Bitcoins mined every day to fulfill the need by major companies. What it comes down to is there is a large and emerging group of institutions that have an enormous capital base that are reallocating, that are all effectively initiating allocations to this space. And if you think about the supply demand model of a commodity, the, the supply curve is, is declining over time to effectively zero and the demand is increasing exponentially. That interest from institutional investors doesn't appear to be slowing down. More than six out of 10 investors surveyed by Fidelity in 2020 believe digital assets have a place in investment portfolios. And those inflation worries, well, they're not going anywhere either. I do not think it is a, a bubble really because of what's happening with the US dollar. Our currency is becoming super inflated. Countries around the world are strapped for cash. The COVID pandemic has decimated government coffers and because raising taxes isn't really an ideal option, in places like the U.S. where there is record high unemployment, some countries are just printing new money instead. Bitcoin isn't pegged to other currencies. It's valued against that limited supply of mined coins, which makes it the perfect alternative to a depreciating U.S. dollar 
and a hedge against inflation. For someone in South America or, you know, for example, in, in, in Venezuela, where you're going through a regime and your currency is appreciating daily, it represents stable value, which is a hard concept for us to grasp. The world's biggest Bitcoin buyers are increasingly based in the U.S. If you break down the, the uh, Western hours and Eastern hours, there seems to be a clear bid through Western hours, which would indicate U.S. institutions buying Bitcoin and Eastern-based uh, institutions, potentially whales and, 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 and mining farms and, and exchange operators that are selling down during Asia hours. As more of Bitcoin's trading activity moves stateside, the question of how to regulate cryptocurrencies has been top of mind for many of the country's financial regulators. We have right now a patchwork of state and federal regulation. Bitcoin is regulated according to how you use it and where you live in the U.S. It's quite a fragmented process because there are many different financial agencies in the United States, both at the federal level and the state level, and each has a particular area that they regulate. The U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission treats Bitcoin as a commodity. The IRS regards it as a property. And even though former Securities and Exchange Commission Chairman Jay Clayton made it clear that Bitcoin is not a security, the SEC does also play a role in regulating the cryptocurrency when, for example, it is offered to retail customers through an investment fund. Some states have, have become very aggressive, and they're doing that because there's a lot of concern about consumer protection, retail investors uh, getting ripped off. Other states are taking a, a different approach and trying to be as innovative as possible. But every regulator in every state essentially confronts the following question. How do I balance on one hand uh, promoting innovation and economic growth, and on the other hand, ensuring there's no fraud, manipulation, or damage done to investors. And my view is that what we really need is a national framework with consistency among the states. Despite Bitcoin's recent dip, standardizing cryptocurrency regulation across the country is going to be key as time passes. Right now, Bitcoin's market cap is still relatively small. It would have to quadruple to match the $2.7 trillion that are invested in gold. And take a look at this chart. Bitcoin is dwarfed by companies like Tesla. And the number of people who own crypto, also surprisingly quite small. Today, I still think in terms of real holders, it's still less than a million people people out of 7 billion. So it's still low in terms of penetration. But as the Taihudu family can personally attest to, this is changing fast. The adoption is spreading worldwide at a very rapid uh, pace. It has all the plus for gold, store of value. It has all the plus for uh, physical cash, because it's peer to peer cash. And yes, you can also trade options and futures. It has everything combined in one you know, asset. Bitcoin is a revolution. 